So um, why don't we get started? We're just uh, very pleased, John Cochran, are very pleased that Lena McWilliams has agreed to speak to our economic policy working group. Uh, she's just um, resigned, stepped down from as chair of the chairman of the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, where she began in, in uh, 2018, June 2018. So it's quite a quite a run. I um, I noticed that um, Elena got her law degree and undergraduate degree from Berkeley, not too far from where many of us are sitting, not all of us. She she started practicing law right here in Palo Alto, where, where some of us are sitting. Uh, been been involved in financial markets for a long time, including working at the at the Fed for for three or four years. So, but anyway, uh, we're really pleased to have Elena speak today. She'll speak for 12, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have 30 minutes of Q&A. So just raise your hand uh, if you'd like to speak or just jump in. Uh, the title of the talk is Banking Policy in an Era of Partisanship, which is a wonderful title. So Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, uh, for inviting me to speak today. And uh, I have to tell you, I always wanted to come to Stanford and when I was applying to colleges back in the early 90s, uh, I was in the United States for about uh, three months, two months, and I was down to $50 in my pocket. And the application to Stanford was $60, <laughs> while the application to UC Berkeley was 40. So here I am, a double bear sneaking into Stanford through the Hoover Institute, all thanks to John. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you, you made my dream come true. Um, many of you know that I have served as uh, recently as uh, the 21st chairman of the FDIC until about 12 days ago. And if you do not, you probably signed up for a wrong discussion. Um, now, many of you are also aware of the turmoil on the FDIC board in December, which exposed the level of partisanship absolutely unprecedented in FDIC's 89 year history. Now, as somebody who um, came to the United States and had to learn about how the United States came to be as a country, um, I have learned that partisanship is not new to America. I often remind people that uh, the United States has had a very turbulent and politically div divisive uh, history since its very creation. Um, there were, there's a great podcast series, it's called American History Tellers, and it talks about the creation of the political parties in the United States. And I listened to them the three episodes and listened again and again, just to make sure I capture how the parties came to be and, and I highly recommend it. And so I had to basically actively seek knowledge about our political process and how the country was formed and partisanship in America, instead of learning it uh, as most of you did through osmosis, growing up uh, in the media, family discussions and social influences. Um, now, what is relatively new is the extent of partisanship in traditionally independent agencies and on issues that have traditionally been nonpartisan uh, in Washington. And uh, which is, I guess, how we arrive at the discussion uh, today, banking policy in an era of partisanship. Now, banking regulation, and John knows this, and many of you on the call, I've seen the list of names, um, are, are very intimately involved with banking regulation and policy in Washington. And I think we can all agree that uh, banking regulation and policy used to be relatively nonpartisan slash bipartisan uh, until uh, very recently. And if you look at the agencies such as the FDIC and the Federal Reserve, they were specifically set up in a manner that would ensure they remain as independent from political influences as possible. For example, the FDIC board members uh, are appointed for six year terms while the chairman is appointed for a five-year term, while the Fed governors are appointed for a 14-year term for governor, and in 1977, Congress limited Fed chairman's term to four years. Now, Congress specifically set up these appointments to transcend president's four-year term. And if you ever get a chance to maybe research a little bit of the Federal Reserve history and the legislation that created the Fed, in uh, 1913 and the prior efforts to create something similar to the Fed um, that has failed, that have failed, you realize that Congress really was really very concerned about creating an independent body. Uh, similar discussions took place with the creation of the FDIC. And so there's a long precedent of these agencies being cognizantly and consciously created as independent agencies. Also our funding streams, for example, the FDIC is not funded through government appropriations. 
partly because Congress did not want it to ever be um, um, unable to function because the government funding did not go through, and partly because uh, it was set up in a way that the fund that the funding stream for the FDIC, our operating budget, came from or comes from uh, the the assessments we impose on banks, and likewise uh, the Federal Reserve also, you know, is not funded through appropriations and neither is OCC. We all have independent funding streams that derive from our activities in the agencies. So I think there's plenty in legislative history, in presidential history, in the bylaws and the operating procedures for these agencies to um, ascertain that they were purposely created to be relatively nonpartisan. Now, in recent years, that nonpartisanship has gradually eroded to the point that even the um, areas of banking policy that should be relatively non-controversial controversial have become controversial for reasons that um, frankly sometimes uh, escape me. And I like to think that I am for all of my, uh, I have come here from another country. I am a little bit of a creature of Washington, DC. Uh, I left the sunny California in 2005 uh, because I was a lawyer at a, at a law firm in, uh, in Palo Alto and I decided to come to Washington, DC after I attended the conference here because I wanted to understand how the political process is done and how regulations are made. And so I went from uh, working at a law firm in California to working at a law firm in DC for about two years. Then uh, nobody told me I was looking for a better work-life balance and I was looking to learn how government agencies function. So I took a job at the Fed in April of 2007 and nobody told me that uh, the crisis was upon us. So I didn't get better work-life balance, but I did learn how government functions on the inside. So I spent about three and a half, four years at the Fed uh, during the financial crisis, then went to work in the Senate. Uh, and um, I had an opportunity and a great honor to work for three different senators um, on the Senate Small Business Committee and the Senate Banking Committee. So I, I would say that I have had some experience understanding how the political process works and also how Congress crafts policy. So what surprises me a little bit about the, um, the extent and the scope of partisanship uh, in, in our policies, not the fact that there is partisanship. It, what, what surprises me is the fact that issues that uh, traditionally have been non-controversial and, and uh, um, I would say uh, neutral politically have become controversial. And so one of the issues that comes to mind is innovation. And I think we can agree that the United States in particular is the country uh, built upon and created on innovation. And when I think of, of many of the phenomenal um, artifacts of American culture that I've grown accustomed to and that have brought me to the United States, you know, I think of Levi's jeans and how they were created, came to be. And I think of uh, the first, um, you know, uh, computers, the, 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 the many things that actually create United States um, as, as the number one marketplace in the world for innovation. And so when I assumed the chairmanship of the FDIC, it was essential to me that the agency prioritize innovation, partly because it's an agency that was created in 1933. And a lot of the laws and regulations that we function uh, based upon or that the FDIC functions based upon. When I say we, I mean the agency, the FDIC. I'm still trying to reshuffle my brain. It's not we anymore. It's them. Um, but the agency was created basically um, in 1933. And, and a lot of our regulations are kind of outdated. They were created in the 20th century and in some cases, even 19th century. So the call report data, for example, every quarter banks provide call report data to, to uh, the FDIC. And that stems from the 1865 law that created uh, national, um, the, national, the National Bank Act that created the OCC. So in some cases, we're functioning based on laws from the 19th century. Um, and uh, I thought that innovation is essential to the FDIC for a couple of reasons, one, if you really want to monitor systemic risk in the United States, if you want to ensure there's financial stability, you have to have the reporting system for data points that you receive from the banks that is as close to real time as we can get. So for example, the uh, call report data we collect, the agency collects every three months. Uh, it's supposed to be at the end of each quarter. Uh, so say March 31st, banks have until the end of April to produce the data, data to us. We analyze the data uh, throughout May and we will release the data set uh, shortly thereafter to the public in what is uh, known as the quarterly banking profile or QBP reporting from the FDIC. And so one of the things that we thought of, um, I frankly thought there has to be a better way 
to get this data versus you know waiting for three or four months to get data points from the banks because if you really if the point of this is to see what the health of the financial industry is in the banking sector you want to get the data in as as close to real time as you can so we came up with this concept that is basically uh, we called it rapid uh, phased prototyping but for, for the lack of um uh, let's not use big terms i call it the bloomberg terminal for banks basically it would be data field uh streaming from banking organizations, our regulated entities to the FDIC examiners on a more timely basis. And even if it's not real time, the goal would be to get to real time. But basically the examiner would be able to wake up in the morning, get a cup of coffee, turn on, turn on the, the Bloomberg-like terminal for this banking data and be able to look both horizontally and vertically. So vertically, how is this particular bank doing that they're examining? And then uh, uh, horizontally, how does it compare to its um, peers, both in that region and also across the United States? And so we started working on that project. Uh, and of course, as everything in government, it takes a very long time to get stuff done. We had 40 uh, companies compete, technology companies compete uh, to create a prototype for this. We came down about two months ago, three months ago to four finalists, and they're currently hopefully still working on a prototype for this concept that we, we were going to test on about nine banks but I'm afraid that um, something like this will get killed um, with my departure at the FDIC because innovation has generally been viewed by the FDIC and other regulatory agencies as, as being too risky, in many cases too risky. And uh, I even had an instance where uh, the FDIC board uh, on a closed, uh, closed vote, basically this wasn't a public vote, voted down the Advisory Committee on Innovation. Um, and I was a little bit taken aback by that because we have other advisory committees. We have a community bank advisory committee at the FDIC. We have an advisory committee on economic inclusion. We have an advisory committee on systemic uh, uh, bank resolution, on, I'm sorry, systemic important bank resolution. And uh, I didn't think that creating a committee on uh, advisory committee on innovation would be a big deal, but it turned out to be something that the, the rest of the board was not open to. Um, the, the big concern I have with all of this is that if we don't allow our banks to innovate, if we don't foster innovation within the banking system, that innovation, it's like water. It will happen anyway because there's consumer demand, there's technological demand, there's business demand. And so if banks are not able to um, adopt to, uh, to being able to innovate and be agile in that innovation, and if regulators don't look upon innovation favorably, that innovation will inevitably happen outside of the banks, inside the banking sector, financial services sector, but not inside the banks. And so as we look at uh, consolidation in the banking sector, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later, it is essential that we allow banks to innovate because some of these small banks, they have $300 million in assets, $500 million in assets. And I often wondered during my tenure, how does a $300 million bank um, uh, in assets is, is able to compete. They usually have one or two branches. They have about 10 to 12 people on staff. And so if they're not allowed to enter into third party partnerships with technology providers, uh, they certainly can't innovate inside. So it's, it's, it's crucial that the agencies provide a path to innovation and adoption of technology and new technology for banks and especially for community banks in rural America. Uh, the, other re the other thing that received a lot of skepticism that I was surprised about was uh, this concept of uh, third party partnerships. So banks basically can create innovation and create channels to produce uh, uh, products and services internally, or they can outsource that uh, through a third party service provider. Regardless of how the bank does that, the responsibility, the compliance responsibility, the risk management responsibility rests with the bank itself. So no matter what the third party provider does, the bank is always on the hook for that relationship and for everything that the third party uh, service provider does. And so uh, one of the things that we realize is that for a lot of these small banks, in order for them to be competitive, especially the $300 million bank, they need to enter into these partnerships. Why? Because uh, producing uh, new uh, products and services to offer to customers and new channels of delivery is extremely expensive for a small bank. So we have encouraged banks to enter into responsible third-party partnerships. And one of the things that we heard was that it is um, uh, extremely tedious to do due diligence to onboard third-party service providers. Basically, you know, a comp company A will go to bank one and they will engage in probably several hundred hours of due diligence to make sure that the bank is comfortable with that, with that uh, service provider. Then that service provider will go to bank two and do the same thing and bank three and so forth. 
So um, I was actually meeting with some fintechs in California and this idea came up that why don't we create some kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval where we would create a standard setting organiza organization in a public private partnership where these third party providers would come and basically get vetted and certified through a, an independent process where the regulators wouldn't control this process, but we would have some input, even if not a controlling uh, uh, input. But uh, it would be almost like a like um, certification that's not uh, uncommon to different parts of government uh, where the private sector can certify and then the, the, the regulators can accept that certification. And so that project, um, we call it the Standard Setting Organization, has been received with um, um, incredible skepticism from um, other uh, board members at the FDIC, partly because um, I, I, they consider that um, some of the, of the feedback that I have received is that it would be um, outsourcing supervision, which was never the intent of this. It was purely streamlining the efficiency and allowing small banks to be able to partner up with third party providers so that they can be more agile and better able to compete. So those are some of the issues on innovation that I think, I hope the FDIC continues to, to, to uh, pursue. Uh, but I'm afraid that a lot of them will will not um, um, be able to uh, sustain uh, past my departure. Uh, now, I briefly touched upon bank consolidation, uh, which brings me to the issue of bank merger policy, another issue that for years has been not controversial. And um, until apparently recently, uh, where in every hearing you get a question about uh, bank mergers and rubber stamping bank, bank mergers and um, and you know, it almost you would almost think that it's an automatic process. Whoever applies gets approved, and that is not the case. And I think it's important for the purposes of any uh, honest, intellectually honest discussion on bank mergers to distinguish between consolidation in the banking space and the bank mergers themselves. They are not they are they are related, uh, but they are not the same thing. And here's why: consolidation in the banking sector has been happening for a long time. You know, Regal Neal. Uh, did a number of things to um, uh, to uh, uh, create an opportunity for banks to do uh, cross-border, cross-interstate uh, 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 commerce in, in banking, et cetera. And so the number of banks that you used to have in the United States that was about 30,000 was probably too many banks, uh, just based on the, on the business models and everything else. And I think with the evolution of technology and online banking, um, and how people bank nowadays, which is through the use of a mobile device, namely, and computers, uh, the, the number of banks in the United States is certainly doesn't need to be at you know, 20,000, 15,000. Now, what is the right number of banks? I don't know, but I know that consolidation has been happening partly because of how the business of banking has evolved, partly because of technological changes, partly because of regulatory burdens that, uh, that are quite costly on small banks in particular, Partly because um, it's it's some some of the um, rural areas have experienced a lot of uh, depopulation over the last 20 years, 30 years, and as a result of that, there's a migration of population. So um, uh, the banking services in in those small communities where you used to have three or four banks, now they may be to a single bank branch or a single banking presence, and so a number of factors lead to consolidations, and then bank mergers are an effect of consolidation, but they're not necessarily um, interchangeable uh, solely with, with uh, consolidation, the concept of consolidation. So with that background, I'll tell you this, Congress passed the Bank Merger Act, and that act uh, is, uh, is, has not been changed in a long time. And basically the way that uh, the FDIC has been looking at uh, bank mergers uh, is through the six statutory factors that Congress gave us. And those statutory factors, you can find them. Um, they're, they're not. Uh, they are relatively not controversial. We have, as a regulatory agency, we have some flexibility how we look at each statutory factor. We have a policy statement on mergers uh, that was last updated in 2008. And then, when you look at the number of mergers um, uh, throughout FDIC history, um, I often joke that you know there was a hiccup on my board over a bank merger uh, uh, review document. And yet, uh, under my chairmanship, uh, there were fewer mergers approved uh, at the FDIC on an annual basis than uh, under my predecessors. There were about 60, um, 64 mergers approved during my full three years at the FDIC versus about 124 uh, for the six full years of my predecessor. And so when I, when I think about that, you know, here, here we're arguing about the bank merger policy document and the numbers simply don't support um, the fact that the FDIC has been rubber stamping mergers. And so I will say that um, 
I am a little bit concerned about the partisanship that has emerged in the bank merger policy area, because frankly, uh, banks merge for a number of reasons. And sometimes um, uh, they're good reasons, sometimes they're bad reasons. And in the, in the good reasons, it's because they, they have found a partner to uh, increase uh, economies of scale and to be able to uh, better serve their communities. Um, and sometimes it's bad because the bank is basically on the brink of failure or it doesn't have a good business model any longer in that community and it's not sustainable. And sooner or later that bank will fail uh, and close its doors and, and those mergers happen as well. So I think that looking at the, at the bank, mer the issue of bank mergers purely through the lens of um, um, kind of a rubber stamping, you know, the agencies are rubber stamping mergers and, you know, having this knee jerk reaction that, you know, any bigger bank is bad and we should just have smaller banks is just not good policy for the United States uh, because the, the mergers uh, in the banking space are not very different than mergers in many other industries. Um, and as a result of that, I think we need to be cognizant of where Congress's authority uh, ends and where the regulatory agency's authority begins. And um, I think that brings me to the general point that I have, I have concerns about the regulators being um, taking some of the congressional uh, authority under their purview. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, when I, when I came to the United States, one of the things that I greatly appreciated has been the ability of the United States to function throughout history based on the set of principles and laws that require, for better or for worse, a lot of effort to change. And that, that the, a lot of effort is a result of the checks and balances in the system. And the checks and balances happen because you want to come to the right policy outcome. And yes, maybe this Congress will not pass that legislation, but maybe the next one will, and that legislation will get improved in the, in the process. And so I always took my job as a regulator to be that my job is not to interpret the law, I mean, to, to make the law, it's to interpret the law. Congress makes the laws, president you know, signs them into, uh, into law, uh, Congress makes legislation, president signs them into law, and the regulators then, within our limited powers that Congress gave us, interpret those laws. And that interpretation should be, should be very clear. This is the lane, and this is the lane that Congress gave us. Stay within the lanes. And so as I look at some of the um, discussions on the bank merger policy, on the um, and some of the other things that I'm going to touch upon, I'm concerned that regulators are basically going and kind of crossing the, the 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 lanes that Congress gave us and expanding their jurisdiction uh, in a way that is probably um, not good for uh, overall policy. Which then brings me to the issue of uh, um, I will say since we talked about innovation uh, and kind of a staying within the lanes and and making sure that regulators don't do too much outside of the lanes that Congress gave us uh, to kind of a, the the crypto assets uh, uh, policy. And I know a lot of a lot, a lot has been written about digital assets, uh, crypto, you know, people call them cryptocurrencies. We have been really careful at the FDIC not to call them cryptocurrency because then the issue becomes if it's currency, are you going to insure it? Uh, luckily for me, a future chairman will have to deal with that because it's a complicated issue. Uh, but um, there has been substantial demand for banks to start providing services related to crypto, crypto assets. Now, banks would love to do this but they're reluctant. Uh, they are reluctant largely due to regulatory uncertainty. And our goal uh, during my chairmanship at the FDIC was to provide clarity so that banks could meet the demand from their customers and allow experimentation, responsible experimentation, uh, while still ensuring that banks are providing services in a safe and sound manner that wouldn't uh, make us at the FDIC very uh, leery and nervous. And so we began with some of the simpler questions uh, such as custody and crypto collateralized lending. Basically, you know, banks are holding these assets in custody. How do we look at that? Uh, these asset, assets are being used to collateralize loans, but the value of the assets can fluctuate widely. So how do we look at that from the regulatory side? And we have started work in that area. Uh, while the, some of the thornier issues such as um, uh, holding crypto on balance sheet uh, for market making, for example, uh, would take longer time and more work. So that is that would be uh, left at some later stages. Now, I, I was hoping that we would get more done before my departure ended, but um, we got done what we got done, which was the roadmap and uh, for how the regular, regular the three agencies, OCC, the Fed, and the FDIC will proceed. Um, but I do expect some of this work to slow down significantly 
uh, and I do expect the new leadership at the agencies to be a lot more skeptical. Um, I will briefly touch upon a couple of other things and then I just wanna make sure that we have enough uh, time for questions. Um, when I joined the FDIC, one of the things that I wanted to take a look at was small dollar lending. And here's what happened in the aftermath of Dodd-Frank. Small dollar lending basically left the banks. And why does that matter? That matters because um, there, is a, there is a Fed study that basically said uh, a large percent of, of the United States population cannot afford four, four, $400 in an emergency. So if, they, if the people have to turn to some source of funding for this $400, where do they go? So the question is, do you want them going to a bank to get a small dollar loan, or do you want them to going to some other entity such as a payday lender um, um, or, or one of the deposit cashing places, advanced uh, deposit cashing places, et cetera. And so from my perspective, it, I, I was thinking that we should have this type of a product within the banking system, within the banks. Why? Because we regulate banks and we regulate them for compliance with consumer protection laws and regulations. And so when I joined the FDIC, I realized that um, there, were, there, was, there was such a fragmented approach to small dollar lending that as a former general counsel of a, of a regional bank, I basically would, would have told my boss, the CEO, do not do small dollar lending. The regulators are all over the place. So there was a guidance from the um, CFPB, I'm sorry, a guidance from the uh, FDIC from 2015. There was a bulletin from the OCC from 2017 that said something slightly different. There was a CFPB rulemaking that the CFPB was revisiting. And then there was a supervisory letter from the Federal Reserve. So if you're a bank that gets regulated, and all of them said something different. And if you're a bank being regulated by at least three out of those four regulatory bodies, what do you do about that? You basically look at the four different documents and you say, I don't even know how to structure a, a small dollar product. So most of the banks actually decided not to do small dollar lending and they uh, allowed that product to be offered uh, through uh, non-bank channels, which in the end, I believe harms consumers probably more than having that product offered within the banks. Um, so we, um, we join hands with the FDIC, with the, I'm sorry, with the, with the Fed and OCC, and we issued a small dollar lending guidance uh, to allow banks to offer these products uh, for people who need them. I think that was hugely help, uh, helpful during the pandemic in particular, as people, um, some of the, especially people who, who, the, uh, who are um, a wage, uh, hourly wage dependent, um, for, for income uh, sought to, to get additional support before Congress um, enacted different versions of the CARES Act. But I do expect that guidance to be unwound and I do expect small dollar lending to be pushed uh, back out of the banks again. Um, overdrafts, another consumer protection issue. So when Congress created the CFPB, it transferred 17 consumer protection statutes to CFPB in Title 10 of Dodd-Frank uh, and gave them additional authorities in that Title 10. And making rules, drafting rules on overdraft uh, is one of those rules. And I know that CFPB is working on this, but there are some indications that the banking regulators uh, will join the, the uh, overdraft party uh, in, um, in a way that probably was not intended by Congress at a time when it transferred the rule writing authority uh, to the CFPB over, over overdrafts. Uh, but again, speaking of kind of a crossing the lanes, that Congress gave us, um, you know, if Congress transfers an authority over something to the CFPB and takes it away from the prudential regulators, then that authority rests with the CFPB. And so prudential regulators working on that uh, issue um, is probably something that Congress did not intend when it transferred the authority. So we'll see how that unfolds. Um, I will touch upon resolution planning and climate change, and then I'm happy to take more questions. So I will say that uh, you know FDIC is was born out of the crisis. It's known for how it handles crises. I joke that if it were not a trademark infringement, our our brand should have been you know on the building. Our brand is crisis, and then they told me there's a book and a movie by that name, so I shouldn't do that. So I will say it in this context, uh, our brand is crisis, uh, and there has been significant progress made among the largest banks in ensuring that they can be resolved through bankruptcy which is how um, we have done the large bank resolution for years. And even in Dodd-Frank, the preferred uh, resolution mechanism is bankruptcy. So we have continued to devote significant time and resources to this effort. Uh, and it is, you know, while, while making sure that Title, um, you know, Title I resolution plans uh, in Section 165D of Dodd-Frank are, are perfected, and we understand how the idiosyncratic uh, parts of the banking of the individual banks are going to be handled in resolution, 
Uh, and so I, I, I walk away from the job knowing that we have done um, quite a bit uh, on that effort. I, in my, in my outgoing, my last speech, I talk about it as well, and you can find it on the FDIC's website. But I am, I'm unclear how the new leadership will approach this particular issue. Um, and um, what, what really concerns me is that there, there is some effort uh, in uh, some circles politically um, on the Hill as well as outside uh, the agencies to use the bank resolution process to force banks to divest businesses and make other radical changes, including using the authorities given to regulators in Dodd-Frank under Title II to break up big banks. And so the issue is really going to be how do we use policy in resolution planning to affect um, good resolution, you know, solid policy on how we resolve these large entities and not allow political influences um, such as, you know, break up the big banks or uh, whatever else may be on the agenda of some entities to, um, to, uh, to use the, the language given to regulators and the authorities given to regulators in Title II of Dodd-Frank to, uh, to break up big banks. So the last topic I touch upon that, that seems to be controversial, even though it shouldn't be, is climate change. And so if you, um, if you woke up yesterday you, and you just hear the jargon about uh, climate change in the United States and what the federal regulatory agencies are doing, you would think that we were asleep at the switch, just woke up, realized the weather is changing, and decided, oh, we should be talking about this. And so I would like to say that I, you know, I saved the FDIC from, from, uh, from this, uh, um, um, you know, um, sleeping beauty, uh, long sleep. But I will say that for decades now, the, 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 the FDIC has basically implemented different supervisory mechanisms that address climate change and weather related events in our banks underwriting models. So here's how we do it. Um, we have had on the regulatory side and on the supervisory side expectations that the banks will basically account for their regional weather related events. So if you're in California and there are wildfires um, um, every year, you have got to, you the bank, have got to protect the collateral in those areas adequately. Uh, if you're in Florida and there's parallel wind, if you're in the Midwest and there is you know, the flooding or the droughts uh, and you primarily deal with agricultural loans, uh, we expect you to take that into your underwriting models and to show us on the regulatory side and, super, and, and our examiners, how exactly are you going to protect that collateral? Then we did additional research at the FDIC to take a look at how do banks fare in the aftermath of major climate events? So we looked at Katrina, we looked at Paradise Fires, we looked at um, different hurricanes uh, and, and looked frankly at uh, Midwestern flooding and, and droughts and looked at how did banks fare after these major ca catastrophic events. And here's what we found out. Not a single bank failed as a result of these events. If anything, because of FEMA, because of congressional aid and because of the private insurance in place and how banks pro protected the collateral in these areas, there was an increase in the deposits and the funding streams to banks after each of these events. So if anything, their balance sheets mushroomed after the, these catastrophic events uh, and, and no bank failed as a result of it. So if we're going to have an honest discussion about climate change, I think we need to take a look at the existing regulatory practices um, and uh, supervisory um, um, precedent that's been in place for you know, 20, 30 years and more, and then understand that you know, climate policy that the United States government wants to enact needs to be done by Congress. And if we're going to move to, you know, whatever this green new economy is going to look like, if we're going to move away from fossil fuels, fracking and everything else that the United States has been traditionally relying on, that is not um, a place for the FDIC or other financial regulatory agencies to do. That is the purview of Congress. And once Congress tells us how they want us to impact that policy, then it's going to be our job on the regulatory side or their job now to figure out how to implement regulations to uh, make sure it comports with congressional will and the mandates. But asking the regulatory agencies to basically on our own sidestep Congress and enact policies where we tell banks how to bank certain businesses, whether to bank certain businesses and how to conduct uh, banking policy vis-a-vis -vis climate change is actually, I would say it's not even stepping over the lines. I would say it's annihilating the lines that Congress has given us. And so with that, I will say I would like to give you enough time for questions. And I can talk very fast, as you have noticed, probably without notes. So I will, I will answer them as quickly as I can. Thank you so much, Elena. We have lots of questions. And uh, just raise your hand or whatever. I see Kevin, Kevin Warsh has his hand up first. So go ahead, Kevin. 
Great. Th th thanks, John, for hosting. Len, it's great to have you with us. Um, you served with a great distinction at the Fed and the FDIC. And the other thing that you did with, with remarkable grace and dignity is figuring out how to leave um, these organizations that we, that, that we believe in, but at some point it just becomes impossible to stay. So, so, so we're, we're honored to have you with us. Um, let me sort of go to, let me ask you a hard question, which is, why do you think politics has entered the FDIC and the Fed this way? You know, what's the proximate cause of why these things we used to fight about ideologically, I mean that in a good way, about different views about the banking system, the role of these agencies, why is it partisan now? Is it because politics is so in the air and it's at everyone's kitchen table and these institutions uh, feel that? Is it because the people that are in and around these institutions are inherently more partisan, less, less um, focused on public policy? Was it the institutional norms themselves are breaking? What, what do you think was the, was the reason for the surge in partisanship at places like the Fed and the FDIC? It's a great question, Kevin. And I will say that I have, I have actually, um, so I spent about six years in the United States Senate and uh, three or four, you know, between three and a half, but three and a half, four at the, at the Fed and now, uh, you know, all, all, three and a half at the FDIC. And I looked at these institutions from inside. Um, and frankly, I have tried to figure out, you know, why is there such a breakdown of, of, uh, of traditionally nonpartisan topics and issues and personalities at these agencies. And I will tell you that uh, institutional norms will not break unless people break them. So in, in, a, in so if people are looking at, um, I would say that some of these congressional appointments, people are policy, right? So whoever you put in this place, you kind of have to understand, is this person going to adhere to the norms of how these institutions were set up? Will they try to work collegially with, with others? Will they, will they try to find a common path or will they just, uh, you know, um, try to undermine the process from within? And so I will say that uh, in many cases, uh, because of the deadlock in Congress, some of the policies cannot uh, get voted out of Congress. And so there, there are congressional members that then try to influence politics uh, through policy at the regulatory agencies, you know. And I remember, you know, I would sit in hearings, congressional hearings, and I always used to, uh, say that you never know what kind of a question you're going to get. And so I had to look at every question with a view of, are they trying to politically corner me in a way that I would say something that, you know, would be bad for the agency or for the, for the independence of the agency. Uh, you know, when we talk about um, the, the independence of these agencies, for example, the document, uh, the request for uh, information on mergers that, you know, my board, uh, let's say um, did not really have good coffee session over uh, you know, um, there might have been a little uh, uh, mischief there, but the document basically starts by saying pursuant to the executive order. And there is a reason that these independent agencies have been independent from the executive, from the office of the president, right? And the reason to, for that has been that so that we don't swing like this every two months with a new executive order. And we have really the Fed, as you know, from your, your time on the, on the Fed board um, and the FDIC, frankly, for 89 years now, we have said we're not subject to the executive orders. So subjecting the agency to something like the, um, you know, merger executive order from the president basically takes away, it chisels away the independence. And I will say that I don't have, you know, a definitive answer as to why, but I will tell you that um, I think it's partly because the deadlock in the, in the Congress to get legislation passed. But again, it was designed, Congress was designed in a way so that it would take a long time to get legislation passed so that it's, it's more prudent and better thought uh, through. Uh, and I think partly because, um, you know, with social media, I think a lot of um, politicians are looking to score easy points. So they will attack you on something on, on Twitter or, or in a congressional hearing, put a YouTube hit for 20 seconds and, and, and get, you know, either donations, votes, whatever it is that they're looking to get or political prestige. And then th those things, unfortunately, influence policy now, which is not how really these agencies were set up to, to, to function. Lena, thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Lacker, here. go ahead, Jeff. Another FMC member, former, another former. Yeah, yeah. Uh, young, good to see you. Um, I enjoyed our Jeff, conversation. Can I, should, can I just add, can I just, sure. I shouldn't be even speaking about the Fed history because Jeff is probably the foremost historian here. Um, I, I defer to Michael Bordo on that, but uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversations um, back when you were in your Senate days. Uh, before I left. And uh, congratulations on a 
a smooth a smoother departure than I had from the Federal Reserve System. Um, so uh, I want to follow up on your your comments about resolution planning, and uh, this always struck me as you point out. Uh, planning for bankruptcy, using the bankruptcy code for the holding company is the cornerstone of the methodology of designing plans uh, for banks to resolve themselves. And yet, I always had the sense, it's been five years since I was in the Fed and had contact with staff members over this, but I always got the sense that that was something of a fig leaf and the intention was that those plans would serve very well for guiding the institution through an orderly liquidation authority resolution at the run by the FDIC. Of course, as you know, the orderly liquidation authority, they can draw on treasury funds. The Fed can lend, presumably. Now, the, I, my understanding is the wills are requiring these institutions to not rely uh, heavily on, on discount window lending, or at least that, that was true back then. But I'm wondering how seriously Washington uh, bank regulatory uh, practitioners um, at the staff level take um, bankruptcy outside of the Lord orderly liquidation authority. And you, as you know, this this is this the cross current here is too big to fail. Where the, the orderly liquidation authority was held up as a model that says, "We'll see, um, no taxpayer funds are going to be used." But then, you know, the authors of that, like Barney Frank and others, have had to retreat and real recognize, "Well, look." Too big to feel is there. We're just not getting it from the taxpayer. We're getting it from tax on banks through orderly liquidation authority. Um, related, let me just add one thing. I understand from economists who were at the Squam, the famous Squam Lake gathering that produced a book and a, a laundry list of recommendations, many of which ended up in Dodd Frank, proposed living wills and never thought they were never thought they would be taken seriously. Didn't take them seriously as something that banks should actually do in the event of a large failure. So I'm just wondering how those cross currents looked to you from your perch at the FDIC chair. So the perch is gone. Uh, so I'm in my little home office here. So it's a little perch. Uh, it is on the second floor. So I have a little perch. Uh, but um, I will say this, um, um, as we look at Title II, uh, you know, Title I resolution uh, plans in Section 165 and how Title II orderly uh, resolution and liquidation would go, um, th th the way you have to look at the living wills is basically, are they credible? So the question before the FDIC is, is are they credible? So take any bank. I don't want to name any banks because every time I name a bank, it, you know, I get a call from the CEO. So I won't name any banks. But take, take bank, you know, take bank, bank one. Let's just call it bank one. Um, and uh, um, when, when you look at the resolution plan for that bank one, it states it's large systemic important because otherwise it wouldn't have a living well. When you look at that, you really have to go into the deep, you know, deep dive into different segments to understand uh, what is, how, are you, uh, how are you going to resolve its derivatives business, right? How are you going to resolve, what's the cross connectedness? What, what, are you, what are you really looking at? So these banks producing every two or three years, you know, 20,000 pages that are just like updates on the prior you know production is not it's helpful to the FDIC but not really helpful and so what I told people um, um, at the FDIC staff was that what's actually more helpful is like let's make sure are we fine with that 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 overarching document that they produce you know last time around if we're fine with that can we do a deep dive on the individual issue areas where we think they need to do more and understand for themselves do they you know do they know how many subsidiaries something as simple as do they know how many subsidiaries they have and you would think it's a simple question, right? It's not, let me tell you, because I've learned as a general counsel of a regional bank, sometimes you have a subsidiary for a single purpose of a syndicated loan someplace. And I'm like, how did we create this? It's, and so, so creating the org structure. So I think there's a really useful uh, process through the living will analysis, but I do think uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not like one and done. You constantly have to ask questions. And what I really think would be the most useful thing and I would love, love, love in, in, a, in an apolitical world uh, where resolution is not, has not become so politicized because of, of the, the, the things you mentioned. I would love to have once a year, and I told this to some bank CEOs, I would like to have a sit down exercise where their team, the bank's team sits down with the FDIC team and we do like a dry run. You, you failed, we're resolving you today. And where are the issues? And do actual the actual exercise of of you know it's still an exercise of resolving it and I think that would be that would be really useful if we could come to that point but I think um, you know for various reasons um, 
people are not as open to that as maybe they would be in a in a in a politically neutral world. So I could say many many other things. So to to Jeff to watch what you said, but uh, I want to thank you for your service as well, and you. for your education on the history of the Federal Reserve. I know as we were drafting some parts of legislation as to how to. Uh, Take a look at the Federal Reserve System and whether or not it needs to, to have like a review of how it was set up. Uh, your knowledge base was just phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Good answer. Anat, go ahead. Hi. Sorry. Sorry for being late. We had a recruiting meeting at uh, our finance group, so a few of us are missing. But I'm glad I made it here because I care a lot about FDIC and I had a familiar a lot of familiarity with it with this one agency. Uh, as you know, Elena, I'm glad to see you. Uh, Nice to see you, so I, you know, my I had two very good friends in the FDIC, um, and they are they were uh, no longer there. Uh, Sheila Bear and Tom Honey. So uh, on on these and Sheila, as you know, before she left, she appointed me to the Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee, which is why I raised my hand when when Jeff mentioned too big to fail because that's a, a, a subject I've thought about a lot. Uh, and uh, also to the extent that, you know, people like Squam Lake, which John Cochran sitting here was part of, uh, they recommended, uh, you know, maybe living with, they also recommended cocos and all kinds of debt that absorbs, uh, that, that absorbs losses when somebody presses some magic button uh, in some regulatory agency. And I asked, you know, exactly who is it going to be that's going to press that button? Well, in FSOC, the Treasury Department, good luck to all of us. You know, Tim Geithner was there and he didn't press any buttons. So let's be realistic here. The living wills, the bankruptcy code, and even the documents that uh, you know you at Hoover created about that uh, are only as good as as anybody's ever going to use those things. Uh, we have problems in the bankruptcy court that have to do with derivatives, precisely what you mentioned. We have a lot of interconnectedness. The living wills are ten thousand pages, and good luck to you know. And all the expenses that get spent are just you know it's ridiculous, really. Um, and so some of us have been uh, arguing for uh, for certain preventative measures, uh, as you know, uh, and you know they seem toxic to the banking sector because God forbid they have uh, you know equity funding we and we would take away some of the subsidies that they rely on. Uh, so somehow this uh, FDIC forever demanding more uh, increased e capital uh, didn't uh, didn't manage to do it, and maybe the Fed are the people who don't want it. The, part, the point is when Tom. When Tom um, Honig was here a few years ago, he said in a CEPR talk, too big to fail is still here. And that was not that long ago. That was about 2017 or so. Uh, I remember this because I quoted him in a, in a 10 years to the crisis kind of talk. Uh, so uh, so what's your view? Uh, is too big to fail still, uh, still uh, here? And, and if so, why uh, 10 years after Dodd-Frank uh, that's the case. Uh, I, I, I hope. I, I mean, my answer is politics, but I want. I'm curious yours. Yeah. So it's a it's an appropriate question for for a for a discussion named you know banking policy in an era of partisanship. Um, and I think I'm familiar, you know, with your, with your work and your books and this as well, um, and our conversations in the past. And, and thank you for your service on the Systemic Resolution Council. As you know, we, we actually put more judges on the council for bankruptcy judges for executive. You picked me out. <laughs> but no, we're shifting. We're, uh, we are staggering the board, so it's it's changing every two years. But um, so here is um, here is my my take on on your on your question. We have done a tremendous amount of work. On, on so-called too big to fail, you know, and and as you know, you have been privy to a lot of these um, inner inner uh, agency groups and et cetera, et cetera. And I know that you know your work has influenced that process as well as as the work from the Hoover Institute. Um, I I am leery to answer the question of you know is it is it are we done? We're never going to be done. Why? Because th these banks are morphing. So you take a look, you know, again, I won't mention names, but some of them have shrunk their footprints. They, are, they have simplified their models. They go from, you know, 150 countries to 100 countries. They have shredded businesses. They have become smaller. They have become more agile. So you hope that uh, through regulatory policy, you incentivize behavior that you want these banks to have in terms of how they would um, act in a crisis, right? And so much has been learned from 2008. I think we have, uh, you know, more more ways to go, more directions to go as as the nature of banking has changed and and the complexity of these institutions has changed. So for you know many cases they're they're not as um, I would say widespread geographically or as diverse in terms of the products and services they offer, but they're more complex 
in how they offer those products and services because of technology and different distribution channels. So I think that work is never going to be done. It's going to be evolve and morph as, you know, as we do. And luckily for me, I was only the 21st chairman. And if you look at the bank resolution, we only had eight banks fail on my watch. So I think that alone makes me the most successful chairman of the FDIC. So I'm going to take that as the metric. Good work. John Cocker has a question. Uh, thanks. Um, as I was Googling up uh, you, I, I noticed almost all the discussion seems to frame this as in terms of the climate change issue. Uh, you said that there were um, FDIC reports showing absolutely no impact or in fact positive impact on banks of weather events. I was aware of the New York Fed staff report, Fed, yeah. uh, but uh, if you could point us they don't seem to be on the FDA website, at least. They're not. The They're not on the FDIC. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, no, absolutely not on the FDIC. Here is um, <laughs> reports. So here's the, here's the thing. Uh, you could Hoover could request them from the FDIC. Um, uh, we did not publish them because, and I'll tell you, I'll, uh, in, in, it's very appropriate for this discussion. Um, by the point by the time in, by the point in time when we came and this was ready for publication, it became such a politically polarizing issue that you couldn't publish something like that without people accusing you of, as an agency, of being political. So notice what happened at the Federal Reserve. It wasn't the Federal Reserve Board of Governors that published that report. It was the San Francisco Fed that published one and the New York Fed that published the other one. So, you know, and as you know, when convenient, uh, and Kevin, I, if Kevin is still there, I hope he's not mad at me for saying this. When convenient, the Board of Governors will say, you know, the Fed said, and when it's not convenient, it's the Federal Reserve Banks that said it. And, and, and Mr. Lacker, President Lacker will know that as well. So we didn't publish that. Uh, it was done through our Division of, in, of Insurance and Research. It's a very solid work product. Um, and um, I, I don't think that the FDIC could refuse it to you if you ask for it. So, so uh, we could get them. And can we refer to them or, or would we be allowed to put them up or on the web or what? You can, if the FDIC, I, they should send them to you and if, uh, provide the link or you know give them to you and, and what you do with them is at that point uh, up to you. I'm not your okay. legal counsel, John. You have, you, I, am, I'm, I am licensed to practice law in California, but I'll have to leave it to uh, somebody smarter as to what you can do with that document. Well, if you could follow up later and, and send us sure. uh, a suggestion of who to email in order to request these documents, I would be uh, very sure. amused to try. Yeah, well, good luck. So let me ask this question about the partisanship, which was in your title and you alluded to it a lot. And you have this, the Reform Act, which is trying to make sure the appointment process is not so partisan, I guess all presidential appointments and things like that. Maybe that's one way to go. I guess it's still partisan, but what are your thoughts about how to deal with this? Actually, partisanship has its own role, but I agree, it seems to be too far, but any thoughts about how to deal with it? It's not, of course, just the FDIC, it's the Fed, it's all over the place. It's not the FDIC, so you have to, I think throughout the confirmation process, as, the, as, as different personalities get appointed, it is essential that they understand uh, the role of these institutions. Uh, and and if, you, if you believe in the mission of the FDIC, if you believe in what the FDIC stands for, the, you know, promote financial stability in the United States, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example having the meltdown at the FDIC board a month after month after month on every single issue that comes up as innocuous as an advisory committee on innovation would be a terrible precedent for the agency, terrible precedent for the agency created to maintain financial stability in the United States. So I think it's important that, that folks who get appointed uh, to these positions are actually um, a do, do have um, the, the greater good in mind and the greater good being the independence of these agencies uh, governing from um, an empirical perspective, the evidence has to support what we're we are doing. It can't be just you know that we believe something. Well, if we believe, show me the proof. You know, let let's let's go. You know, show me causality. And 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 I think it has to be um, that people who assume these jobs assume so for the right reasons. And I would say the right reason is always the United States of America and what's good for the country. And so for me personally, you know, I decided to step down when uh, I realized that the agency would be permanently damaged uh, by the, the, you know, the, the palace intrigue at the FDIC board that gets tweeted about and reported in the media as if, as if we're a banana republic. Uh, and I frankly um, didn't think that was right for the agency and for the staff at the agency and the independence of the agency. So I'm hoping that people who actually get these jobs um, do have the greater good, not just of the agencies, but um, of, you know, of the United States in mind. And, and for me, it was always making sure that our financial markets remain the most competitive in the world. 
that uh, we promote innovation and entrepreneurship in America because that's what built this country uh, on the economical side and that the regulators stay within the lanes that Congress gave them because otherwise, you know, we don't, we start looking not much different than um, regulators in countries that don't have the principles of governance uh, and democracy that we pride ourselves on in the United States. This one last question, I may have to go, but this thing that you don't interfere with, you stay in your lanes, someone else adjusts the lanes. It's, you know so much more than most people. So why can't the agencies influence what lane you're in or change the lanes? Maybe they just- can. yeah. They can't and they have over time. Now I have been super judicial uh, 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 judicious, I should say, I, sh I have been super judicious about my recommendations to Congress. I only made one recommendation to Congress in three and a half years. Why? Because uh, you want to be careful how much you throw as a regulatory head at Congress. Uh, and that was to uh, not make broker deposits such a bad thing, uh, putting putting a cap on broker deposits uh, if a bank is, is uh, deemed, um, is, if it's downgraded to um, a four in the CAMELS rating, but to basically Put a, put a cap on the growth of the bank and not uh, uh, malign an entire set of the deposit class. And that was the only recommendation I really made in three and a half years because I was really careful not to uh, influence that process and to stay within, again, the regulatory purview that Congress intended for the FDIC to stay within and to be able to empirically justify the work uh, of the agency as we moved forward on different I'm regulations. I'm sorry, now, did you have another question? I do, but I think it's late by now to ask. So, Elena, I hope to be able to ask you. My question was very, very provocative, and it has to do with disclosures of, of again, complicated banks, not the simple banks. But, uh, you know, I, I, in my view, they're so poor that uh, if, if I was just on the deposit insurance fund, if I was uh, uh, sort of talking about what it's worth to them to be have the deposit insurance as you know what they would be the fair market price for that insurance, and I've talked to the, the to the deposit insurance people about how they price the deposit insurance. I think it's they. I, I, my view on this is that they're close to being uninsurable given their disclosures. In other words, if I was insuring with my own money, I would not insure them. But it's a provocative statement. Maybe we can talk. No, about but, that. no, that's fine. That's fine. So as you know, there are two different formulas. Uh, there's a formula for large bank, complex banks. Uh, it. it puts a little bit more, um, I would say, premium on some of the complexity of those institutions. Uh, but in, in the end, you know, the insurance that's provided through the FDIC uh, is, uh, was created by Congress. So this is not, uh, I don't have a, I don't have the right to say, should they be privately insured or should government insure them? Again, you know, back to John's point, I stayed within my lanes and my lanes are that we implement the positive insurance and do these assessments and do the formulas and try to understand the complexity of the underlying asset categories as we put all of that in the formula. So let me just say, uh, we have to stop. It's 12.59, I promised uh, Elena, we would stop so you could catch the train to New York and do some good stuff. So thank you so much for, it's a complicated set of issues, that's for sure. Very cool. I'm happy to come back at some, some later point, but listen, thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned, John, California is still my home. I'm always happy to be at Hoover, and thank you for getting me to Stanford through the okay. back door. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>